everybody, welcome back to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friends, Charles. Yes, we say friends today because we have a very special guest with us. Uh, with us today is a mathematician turned best-selling fantasy author. You may know him from his work on the Star Wars Missile Defense Program, or perhaps from his Sunday Times best-selling series, The Broken Empire Trilogy. His other fantasy series includes The Red Queen's War, The Book of the Ancestor, Impossible Times, and The Book of the Ice. Collectively, his works have been translated into 25 languages and have sold over 2 million books worldwide. His newest series, The Book That Wouldn't Burn, releases on May 9th and is available for pre-order now. Please welcome Mark Lawrence to the show. Mark Lawrence, thank you so much for being here with us today. No problem. Nice to be here. Well, I this is such a exciting moment for us, Mark. I feel like we've been talking about your books for 10 plus years now. We've been such big fans for a long time, and it feels like a real uh, full circle moment to have you on the show today. So we're really excited to have you here. Well, thanks. I've uh, listened to quite a lot of that discussion, actually, and uh, I guess that's why I'm here. Yes, that's that's amazing. That's no. very exciting. Yeah, I mean, it was a huge moment for our podcast when we were first starting out. You know, we did Red Sister, the first book in the book of the Ancestor, and you were kind enough to listen and say some nice words. And yeah, that was that was really kind of you. So we're super grateful for that, and it, and it meant a lot to us as like kind of a legitimizing thing early on to have an author who. I mean, I remember Charles recommending uh, Prince of Thorns, yeah, over a decade ago, uh, back <laughs> not too long after it came out, and uh, I remember loving it and getting to talk to Charles about it, so it's, it's like a really cool moment for us, but uh, we're also really excited about your new book coming out, I really want to hear more about it. The book that wouldn't burn releases on May 9th. And we're wondering if you can give us a little synopsis and some of what your readers can expect from this exciting new novel. Mm, I should have seen that one coming, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite strange to hear you guys talk about Prince of Thorns being 10 years ago, because uh, I still feel relatively new to this, but um, yes, it was it was ten more than ten years ago, and the tenth uh, year anniversaries of Prince and King of Thorns have come out now. So, uh, right. yes, um, I've never been very good at these elevator pitches. Um, uh, partly, I, I I hate telling people what what my books are about because um, I want them to read them. And, and I guess that's a sort of chicken and egg thing, because if you don't tell them anything, then they won't read them. But if you do tell them, then I feel like I'm somehow robbing the goodness of, out of them. Um, I, I ran a, a, a poll yesterday or the day before, um, and the question was, uh, do you read the blurbs on the back of books? Um, and... Um, I think it was less than 50% said they always read them. Um, and there was a good sort of 10% who said, I, I never read them. And and I I don't read them. Um, I write them myself because it it sort of emotionally distressed me so much uh, having the, the publisher do it for me and basically spoil the book on, on the back of the book. So I said, like, you know, let, let me try and and... I write the blurbs, uh, which are then sort of messed about and negotiated over, but I, I do the bones of them, uh, with the the point being that I want to give people the the vibe and the feeling of the book without actually telling them a damn thing about it, because um, you know, some of the spoilers I've seen on the on the back of books uh, have just been uh, atrocious and and that sort of thing distresses me. Obviously, everyone's different, and, and some people. Um, I ran another poll ages ago because uh, my best friend has this, this, uh, uh, well, I call it evil, an abominable habit of whenever he starts a, a new book, he will immediately turn to the last page and read the last oh. page. Oh, and, and I thought, who do does that? that? That's just insane. <laughs> yeah. So I ran a poll, 
um, and about 2,000 people answered the poll. And it turned out 7% of the fantasy readers out there do exactly that. That's wow. 7% and... too many. I feel like yeah. <laughs> you can't read it out of context. That's what we're all kind of getting I to, mean, right? It, it, it does seem insane, but I have um, become to appreciate it, at least intellectually, that it's a, a form of anxiety management that the the people like to feel in control you know a lot of people like to feel in control and uh, this is one way of, of taking control of the process um okay. in the same way that if um that those sort of embarrassment comedies that, they, that are on tv uh where things get increasingly more and more painful you know i will hide behind my hands and sometimes have to leave the room just because they are so painful the situations they put the people yeah. in um and i can see that this is a a form of that for readers where they will uh, be distressed uh, that they don't know where the thing's heading or that there might be a twist coming that will upset them or something. so they spoil themselves and the easiest way to spoil yourself is to go to the end of the book and see if such and such person survives and you know, are they happy and, and this and that so I can see um, why many of your readers might feel a bit distressed and, and want to flip ahead because uh, <laughs> you certainly do have many of those moments peppered throughout your uh, your series there. You keep us guessing. Yes, and I mean, pe people do that sort of thing sometimes. Uh, some readers, you know, when they get when your character gets into a sticky situation, they will flip ahead and try and find out what, how it resolves because they can't handle attention. And, you know, as, as an author, when you're writing something, you have a very clear idea of how it should be read page by page um and right. um it, it's uh distressing on the other end to to have people sort of you know pick and choose and sort of leap ahead but you know you just have to surrender to that that's just how some people are um so to the original question which was what's the uh the book that wouldn't burn about um well i guess the, the first thing to point out is that it's not a challenge um and it's about a book that wouldn't burn uh, <laughs> rather than being a book that won't burn. Um, it's it's uh, as flammable as the next book. You have to buy book. more copies if they keep Yes, I mean, I encourage people. It, it, so it, it, not it, the worst yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I encourage people to to set fire to them if they prepare to immediately buy another copy, That then that's <laughs> fine by me. Um, <laughs> so the story has um described in in the uh the, the blurb that i put on the back uh involves uh two main characters a, a young woman and young man um and uh they're in very different different situations one has been brought up in um a sort of dusty desert uh environment and, and has known nothing apart from her small collection of huts there um and the other one has lived his whole life trapped in this um big chamber inside a uh, enormous potentially infinite uh, library um and that the two stories spiral around each other and uh, there's plenty of things exploding and blood spilled and all that sort of stuff but the um the, the i like to say um some books have themes some books don't some books are just sort of what you see is what you get and that's the end of it uh, and some books sort of very literary fiction uh books are completely dominated by themes and, and the characters are basically just there to exercise the ideas that the the uh the author is trying to put over to you um, and you have stuff in in the middle and i like to say that you can tell if you're reading uh or if you've read um some literary fiction because if somebody asks you what the book was about if you i mean if your answer is to go um this is a summary of the plot then that wasn't literary fiction whereas if your answer is uh, to the question what it what it was about is to start talking at some completely different level about you know it's it's addressing what happens when a man yada 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 then that's literary fiction right. um <laughs> and this certainly isn't literary fiction but it does have some themes and the um those are uh, things i feel i can talk about because they, they don't constitute spoilers in any way whatsoever um and they are to do with um, you have this enormous library, um, which essentially represents the uh, repository of, of all possible wisdom. And uh, the questions are revolving around access to it and how it's accessed and what the consequences of, of that sort of access is. And it's fairly obviously a, um, an analogy to the Internet, if you like, that the, uh, the librarians are 
um, mm. performing the function of a search engine. Um, and they, you know, that when they satisfy your requests, there are, because there are essentially an infinity of books, their choices as to which books to, to put in your hands, that is uh, essentially a, a function. I'm just being attacked by this, this cat. I've let Wobble into the room. He's a, a large oh, main wow. coon. He's <laughs> sitting on the back of the uh, the sofa and he is securing his claws in this very thick jumper that I've decided to put on against the, the night cold. Um, hmm. So anyway... The he, plane he, of a uh, cat out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, literally, I had to open the door for him just before uh, we uh, we started to stop all the meowing. Um, interrupting proceedings <laughs> um but the uh the idea here the the um the library gives them a, a chance to talk about um in an indirect way and uh, not not sort of preaching at you and, and not even part of the main story but these themes run through it about um how we choose our information and about the difference between um uh knowledge and wisdom so if you just give people free access to all information that's out there, it's essentially like handing a cutthroat razor to a toddler and saying, you know, have at it, you know, and then just sitting back and waiting for the bleeding to happen. But on the flip side, um, who's to say, you know, you're not allowed to uh, to read that. You're not you're not capable of handling information in that. Um, and there are, there, there are those two competing schools of thought. Um, and they provide a sort of dynamic that sits behind the uh, the story, which is, as I say, a much more traditional fantasy story with um, uh, plenty of the, the normal things that I put in my books. Wow. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I've always really appreciated the, the way that you're able to write stories that work both at the level of just an entertaining fantasy, but also allow for discussion into themes. I know with Book of the Ancestor, like allowed for us to have these kind of plot focused, character focused summer uh, or episodes, as well as like we did an episode discussing how the theme of friendship plays out and what means the main character, Nona. So it's it's really exciting to hear we'll get both explosions in the book that wouldn't burn as well as uh, look into some themes that uh, are extremely relevant to uh, uh, like what we're dealing with now you know you say this uh, infinite repository of knowledge and uh, how that can parallel what we're dealing with with the internet uh, I, th I think I'm really excited to see how you get into the meat of that that theme yeah uh, I think well, hopefully I've got the balance right and uh, people will be entertained, but also um, have some uh, some questions and thoughts stimulated at the same time, um, you know. But I don't want to give the wrong impression. It is primarily a a, a fun fancy book, much in the uh, the same vein as, as all my others. But uh, as you said, that they the other books do tend to have a, a th some sort of themes running behind them. And often those themes... Uh, because I tend to think of, of the character first, often the themes are essentially generated by the character. So like as you, you mentioned, um, uh, Prince of Thorns. So here we have uh, a character who is, um, well, essentially in, in many people's books, evil uh, and does absolutely terrible things. Mm -hmm. But he's also um, very young and very broken. And there are questions there about, um, you know, to take it to an absurd level if a two-year-old were to to stab someone you wouldn't hold them responsible for it as a sort of 30 year old man so the question is at what point in your childhood do the the sort of crimes the atrocities you commit uh start to become things that will stain you forever um and is there any um redemptive power in simply growing up that uh and leaving these things behind you um and so there's this, there's a nature versus nurture argument going on with Jorg, and there's also the the age thing going on, um, and and those themes that go through the whole trilogy are just sort of born out of his out of his character. So from day one, when, once I said I'm going to have a character like this, they were there, and the in some ways the whole story is just 
exercising the character so that those things can come to the fore in various forms. Yeah, I, that's fascinating because when Dylan and I reread uh, Prince of Thorns recently and we had to keep reminding ourselves like Yorg is 13, like we, yeah. <laughs> we got to try and imagine that in our minds. So definitely pushing that character to the extremes and, you know, we'll keep it spoiler free here. The extreme, like there's definitely a lot of intense moments in that story perpetrated by Yorg, of course. But um, yeah, it's just one of those things that's like you, coming from the character focus and then pushing that to the extreme. That's certainly kind of carries through some of your some of your works that we've read um one of the things that i wanted to talk about before we went back too deep into some of your other works is a little bit more about your background what some people might not know and i know it's in your bio and everything but what i would be really interested to talk about is to take some time you have a degree in physics and a phd in mathematics we mentioned the star wars missile defense program um how, like how do you go from making the switch or like what was the switch going from mathematician to fantasy novelist like and like how how was that transition um well i guess there's there's no hard transition at any point there there's no sort of um decision because uh well many people involved in the sciences are also interested in fantasy um, and I don't think uh, my being a, a scientist who writes fantasy is is in any way unique I could mm. I could name a, a number of others um, in that same sort of situation um, and uh, so you know as a kid I was playing D&D &D and I was reading fantasy books and you know my mother read me Lord of the Rings when I was seven and you know, I cried when spoiler gandalf died um and i think we're so yeah i've always the rings right most on the shows <laughs> probably uh, are familiar with that, that one yeah <laughs> I, I feel that yeah. you can take books written in the sort of 50s and you can spoil them i think that's allowed um yes. but the uh what was the question so uh, so you, when you were oh, the, you know, the deep science, into yeah. the into the PhD and you're in mathematics, you're in science, still are. Um, I'm just curious, like, when do you decide to go from a fantasy fan to like actually putting out your first book and and trying to find an agent? Like, when do you decide to take that plunge into writing a fantasy series? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure it was ever a plunge per se. Um, more of a very gradual um progression the you know when i was writing uh when i was playing D, &D i was always the, the gm and i was writing these great big scenarios these dungeons and i filled books with uh that sort of thing and that that's creative writing and then i um in my spare time and full time for one year uh ran a play by a fantasy play by mail i helped run it it was a quite a big enterprise back in the day before email um people would write in on you know snail mail and um we would have about a thousand people adventuring in this sort of shared fantasy world i mean it's a sort of precursor to i guess wow. world of warcraft or, or whatever and so i was writing in my in that year i took off but then for 10 years after that in my spare time in the evenings replies to the turns that these people were sending in so i was basically writing a story back to them and they'd written me a story you know they'd written me a story about what they were going to try and do and how they were going to try and make it happen and i wrote the story back about what then did happen and and so that was creative writing um what an interesting and then i started so you were uh, writing individual um you were writing individual kind of story responses based on the people that mailed in their their actions yes. kind of thing wow yeah and, and then, you know that went on for years and, and there was people who had played sort of 150 turns in, in the game and, and had all sorts of adventures and uh you know we had pub meets and and tabletops as well so the, there was a sort of community built up there um uh, and it was uh it was great fun i would do it now if i had the time um and then i started writing um short stories and i was going on internet groups writing groups and sort of sharing these stories and and later on trying to get them into uh to magazines and none of that is a sort of plunge or a commitment there was just a, a hobby in, in my spare time and and 
um, like most hobbies, uh, I, writing seems to be a curious one because most hobbies, if you if you do a hobby uh, and whatever it is, painting mo models or you know painting pictures or or any of the, the things bowling, whatever hobby you have, you don't tend to think it's going to make a living for you. Um, and yet, a lot of write people who are doing writing will talk about their expectation of or at least their hope that they're going to become a full-time writer and, and make a living out of it um mm. and that that seems a sort of a, a strange difference to me between um most other hobbies and, and writing uh, but for me writing was just a hobby and i didn't have any expectation of, of making a living out of it i didn't um feel that, that what i was writing was particularly spectacular and I, you know, on these writing groups, other people were sending their stories in and I was critiquing them and they were critiquing me. Uh, and I didn't feel particularly special. Uh, I, and I thought that the stuff they were sending in was, was good too. Um, and I also had this, um, no, I mean, I never really had any serious ambition to, or even, yeah, I never had any ambition to, to be an author. And um, on top of that, I felt strongly that uh, it was something that you had to, somehow network and be in the know and know the right people to 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 get into um and even if you didn't happen to you know have a publisher in the family or whatever you'd have to go along to the con conventions and glad hand and and you know just generate that interest um things like say modern art you know you can't just slap a uh, this is why people sort of laugh at it because someone tapes a banana to a wall or sort of throws a, a pot of paint at a canvas <laughs> And they're, and they're saying, well, why can't I sell this for, for hundreds of thousands? But and the answer is often that you have to have a story that goes behind it. You have to have gone, you know, had these galleries and schmoozed with the right people and, and told them why you threw the pot of paint at the wall or, you know, why you take the banana up and, and it, you build up this story. And I thought that the same thing was true of, of, of becoming an author, that you would have to somehow generate that. And that wasn't something I either felt I had the uh, the ability to do or the interest um, plus i just didn't think that that what i was writing was um in, in any way stand out so um yeah uh i wrote books because short stories turned into longer stories um and prince of thorns was mm. the the third book i'd written um and so the first book i wrote you know i showed it to a couple of people and they said yeah that's not very good fair enough uh, and then i wrote another one and and the people on the writing groups you know said this is pretty good um but nobody said you know this is crazy good um and then i wrote prince of thorns and, and people were pretty complimentary about that but i put it in the in a drawer and just kept on writing short stories uh and it spent several years in that drawer it was only when uh one of the, oh. the friends on the writing group um who was uh you know she was financially pretty poor and she didn't have a lot of spare cash but she spent a lot of cash on, on this sort of writer's almanac of places you can you know get details of uh, agents and whatnot, and mailed it to me from from the states at vast expense and i just got it basically shamed into to using i had to tell, tell her something i had to say yes yeah. I, I went through <laughs> and i wrote to these these people and i i gave it the good old college try um so i did and and very quickly that turned into a, a book deal um a pretty big one um wow. And, you know, I think there's an awful lot of uh, luck in the process. Um, I had never read or even heard of Joe Abercrombie, but um, he had established a, a sort of market for the sort of book that I turned out to have written. And it just landed at just the right time that all of the, the publishers of sort of said, yes, this is exactly what we want, because this will appeal to Abercrombie fans. Um, yeah. And that's how it happened. And i kept on working at my science job for another four or five years um to the point where my writing income was you know completely eclipsing my um job income but i was still just doing it because i i thought and i still do have the attitude that, that <laughs> at any point the writing stuff can just go away because it is a matter of popularity uh, you're only as good as your next book and <laughs> it doesn't seem a particularly safe um career so i thought well i'll just keep on doing the science because i like the science and um why not have uh, both strings to my bow and i never um i came very close to resigning but i never actually did resign 
the entire advanced research facility uh, closed down unexpectedly with 150 PhD scientists um, put out of a job. Um, and I was <laughs> all those parents saying, don't go into the arts, you got to go to science. Well, <laughs> look well, which one turned um, out to be more stable for you. <laughs> I was sorry for my companions, uh, though they sure. all did find um, new jobs fairly quickly, but um, I was pleased that I had not resigned and had hung on because then I got my redundancy package. Oh, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Give me that severance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and, and just went on to writing. But uh, well, that's the story. So someone basically kind of was your patron and sent you the like contact guide for agents and you just put uh, Prince of Thorns out there. Um, yeah, I think I wrote to um, one a month for about four months and then gave up and <laughs> a couple of months later um one of them wrote back and said yep uh that looks really good i'll i'll take you on and then a few weeks after that the other two two of them wrote back and said nope we're not interested and the last one never wrote back at all well um, they missed out <laughs> And then the uh, yeah. the agent who did take me on he said um he warned me that the, the publishing business is a sort of very glacial thing it takes forever to get any answers out of people and, and you know don't expect anything to happen soon and then about four weeks later i had um the, these offers from about well i think it was every fantasy publisher in the in the uk and most of the large ones in the us wow in some That's sort of bidding war so Ahead, Sounds man. like you struck grim dark gold right after Abercrombie. Uh, so 2011. Good timing, and of course, yeah, and of course, uh, a great book. So everyone was very excited to get that out there. It's uh, a really interesting journey. You kind of got guilted just by nature of someone who couldn't really afford it sending you something across the pond, and and now look at you. So it's. Uh, uh, it must really feel like, I guess, uh, uh, a shocking path that your life has taken. Yeah, it's um, not what I envisaged. It was rather surprising. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to disabuse anyone of the um, uh, the idea that it, it's in, it's entirely skill-driven. Most of it, or a large element of it, I feel, it is luck. Is writing a book that is fit for the times. Um, it's perfectly possible to write a completely brilliant book and it won't fly in any way shape or form so uh, i think writing a, a good book is is like buying the lottery ticket you you need to be able to write a good book to have that ticket but then once you've got the ticket the chances are you're not going to win mm -hmm. hmm. yeah, we you know we, we've had we've been able to interview a couple different authors and all their experiences are super different like yours mark some sort of like oh i'll like they got a book deal in a week four weeks some took forever but I, I think the one thing they all had in common was they kind of like you made your own luck you've been you know writing short stories and like involved in writing circles for years and you had written Prince of Thorns it sounds like you just had it in a drawer for a while and then you know preparation met opportunity at a, at a certain point and it was able to to take off um he, well, I mean, like I say, I think the making my own luck part was the just putting in the hours to get good enough to buy that lottery ticket. And then there really was the luck that the ticket happened to win. <laughs> and then uh, absolutely. So I, that's like I'm tr it's so funny that we I put myself back to that time when um, the Broken Empire trilogy was coming out. And, um, you know, Dylan and I were, you know, getting into fantasy in a big way i mean the lord of the rings movies had been out and i was always a fan and then it's like around that time game of thrones started to get popular you see like this grim dark full genre kind of take off and prince of thorns just like took that to the edge as well it, it's one of those one of my like go-to like grim dark oh you like grim dark novels and you know, i'm assuming you've read prince of thorns and if you haven't you should it's just one of those pieces it, it seems so a part of that era of this huge grim dark movement and it and it's still popular but one of the things that you know Dylan and I have noticed and, and even in your work as well is that this idea of 
like this grim dark gray morality it it's still continuing today and is still very popular and still so much fun to to read uh but we we've seen these elements of like like these more introspective themes and we've also seen this like emotional attachment to it and i'm just wondering from your perspective as someone who's been you know writing multiple series over the past 10 years if, if you kind of think of grimdark as like a trend in the genre i know you didn't think of it when you were writing the book but if you see it that way and if you see kind of where the fantasy genre is kind of molding and changing and and kind of what's being more popular today um well i mean as you say i i didn't think of myself as as part of any movement at the time the the only um real inspiration i had to show me that um i could write a book like that um apart from the obvious um direct influence from a clockwork orange which is of course um uh, nearly probably 60 no, 61 years old now um uh was george martin so i you know i had read um, game of thrones and he sort of opened my eyes to you know the level of uh, some people get annoyed when you call it realism um but i'm going to call it realism that you can put into fantasy that uh you know to a degree and this isn't like a broad brush but to a degree um fantasy in the 80s say had it, some fantasy authors it, it was like you know when you have those those old greek plays where they put the, the masks on and it's all very stylized and there are certain rules um and, and certain conventions it was like fantasy was to a degree written within a set of conventions um and there were sort of boundaries that you didn't cross and, and george martin took all that away and, and just wrote a, a sort of to me a, a very real raw um, story with with real yeah. dirty um corrupt um people mixed in with you know genuine honest people and all the, all the rest and, and i had not um when i wrote prince of thorns or when it was published read any of the uh, the other people who are cited as as grimdark um, authors um i've read some of them since um but not all of them i, I still haven't read um any abercrombie um one of the things um that sort of I, I I'll say it irks me but I completely understand it is that people are still saying uh Mark Lawrence that grimdark author um and I still see people saying on a almost daily basis certainly a weekly basis you know I tried one book by Lawrence um and it's mostly prince of thorns um and i didn't like it so that's that's the end of it that that's that's me done with with uh with that author um and about the time that uh, prince of thorns came out um i was asked you know i started getting asked to send in short stories for um anthologies and 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 that sort of thing um and because i had a sort of big backlog of these things i've been writing short stories for magazines um it was fantasy faction had asked me for a short story for um the legends anthology that was sort of to back up the david gemmel um legend award uh, and so i just sent them like 10 or 15 and said you know cho choose one you like and the first thing they came back and said was we can't believe these are all written by the same person because they are all very different and it, to my mind yes why can't a writer write a bunch of stories that are all very different um you know you don't expect a good actor to always play the same character you know maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody will come on and, and generally play variations on the theme but if you consider a good theater actor um I know <laughs> I'm not going to to praise Kevin Spacey because he's got all these clouds over him but as an actor he right. fell into many different roles and could portray and, and I only cite him because I can't think of any other um actor to, to put in his place at the moment um, but I feel that's my sort of role to be able to, to to play different roles, to be able to write different books. And so um, I think you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that the the character that followed Jorg, Jalan, was very different from from Jorg, and the character that followed Jalan, Nona, was very different, and Nick mm -hmm. Hayes was very different from Nona, 
and Yaz was very different from Nick Hayes, and they are all very different. And not only are the characters different, but the the tone and the worlds that they're in uh, also different, and the style that the books are written in. Uh, and so I feel that if you didn't like one book by me, it doesn't mean you're not going to like one in a, in the same trilogy. Yeah, you might still not like it, but if in a different trilogy, you know, um, yes, you, you should be able to like it. And that I don't feel any of them are, are properly grimdark apart from uh, the first trilogy. So I, I don't consider myself a grimdark author. I'm a, an author who has written three grimdark books out of about 18. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, your I versatility do. is one of the things that I think characterizes you as an author. When I think about, I guess, as someone who's read a bunch of different works by you and different series, uh, I've always thought like, it's unbelievable that let's say impossible times was written by the same person who wrote broken empire and then uh you also mentioned short stories i just want to give um is it during the dance is that the yep. uh, yeah that short story that is an absolute tearjerker and <laughs> i i dare anyone who's just read uh, the broken empire to please read that short story it's it's pretty quick and uh let me know if you come back thinking like oh this is uh, like just a one trick pony grim <laughs> like just totally different style so i yeah it's it's actually a total bummer that uh, people tend to do that i wonder why authors they they treat a lot a lot differently than like you said actors or some other uh, artists like i i don't know i guess it's kind of you get um what's the word for it typecast um, in acting typecast. it's typecasted um after your first book i i think um that there are a couple of factors i mean some authors may just be really good at writing one type of thing and and stick with it but i don't think that's true of most authors i think um most of the time when that happens it, when you when you change um your style radically you take an enormous risk because the people who sort of jumped on the wagon the bandwagon because you were writing grimdark if you then go and write i don't know some sort of fluffy romance uh, you take too hard a, a left turn they're all going to fall off and because they're your only readers they're going to be sort of um telling everyone this book's terrible when actually it might appeal to a completely different demographic but it's very hard to suck that new demographic in so um to to make these sort of left and right swerves as you're going through your career is not a financially sensible thing to do it is much more sensible to just continue writing the thing that worked in different shapes um and I, i'm it's like the yeah, uh, i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna name any names of people approach. who have done that <laughs> yeah um but, but there definitely are people who have written sort of literally 20 or 30 books in the same world that do the same thing and make the same people happy and that's not a bad thing yeah and make the author potentially more money than if they had um veered into something that they're quite capable of writing but didn't have an audience for mm -hmm. sounds kind of boring uh, though i mean i don't know i'm <laughs> not an author myself but i oh yeah yeah i mean I, i'm not doing this because of any sort of great virtue thinking the world deserves more from me it's simply that i get bored so i would be mm -hmm. terribly bored if i was still writing jog books now <laughs> after 10 years um, you know it's it's funny mark i don't know if you remember but this was about Oh man, it's coming up on three years now, but um, our younger, more fledgling version of ourselves, not too different from now. We had reached out to you uh, via email. We actually wrote you some questions and, and you were very kind to have replied back with three pages of, of response. And now hearing your story of writing back to people, it's kind of making more sense why you would have been uh, so naturally talented at it. But one of the things you did say when we asked you about like, you know, trends within your or using devices within your your certain you know d different series you mentioned that I generally avoid repeating myself so I try to keep most things changing most of the time for no other reason than I get bored doing the same thing for too long mm. so you're true to your word mark 
<laughs> and uh, it makes me excited for um, for the book that wouldn't burn too, just to see kind of what's kind of grabbing your interest this time around. And that's why I think just getting to know authors across their library of work can be so rewarding because yeah, maybe you like someone that cranks out a bunch of books that are all kind of, you know, what to expect and they make you feel good. And then you see people who are like trying to do something different and testing themselves and discovering a story or characters that inspire them to write a whole book or, or, or series even. So um, I know for, for an author like you who kind of goes on inspiration, whether it's a character or a first line, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, which I would love to get into, uh, the first lines of some of your novels um, is, is this kind of what keeps you excited, what prevents you from getting bored and like what kind of gets you to pick up the pen and, and start a whole new series or trilogy? Yeah, I mean, I need to... Uh to be entertained by what I'm writing. Um, and, you know, I could say that's because if I'm not, nobody else will. Um, but really, I, I just need to be entertained by what I'm writing because it's what <laughs> I do all day. And, uh, you know, I, I could go and get a different job or I could have stuck with the science and said I've had, had enough of writing. Um, and um, this cat is uh, harassing me again. Come here. Wobble has unleashed. Yeah, Wobble history. is uh, right. now on my lap, and hopefully he will um, be peaceful there for a, a short while. Um, so yeah, um, variety, and that, that's really also the reason that I don't plan my novels because, again, for me that um, sucks the entertainment value out of them. That if I know what's going to happen, you know, um, and I've I've heard, uh, you know, obviously I'll, there's a huge variety of approaches out there, uh, and. When I went to these um, grim gatherings with um, Joe Abercrombie and, and Peter V. Brett, uh, lots of the questions were about writing process. So I, I heard what they did. And, um, and Joe um, plans his meticulously. He writes a sort of top level description and then he fills that out. And now he's got a, a description for each chapter. And then he fills that out. Now he's got sort of for every page, he's got a paragraph. And then he fills that out and, and just keeps on, you know, it's like those. Um, they used to be on the internet as an image was loading it would load in low resolution and the resolution would slowly increase until you got the full benefit of the thing um it's, it's like that he's he's and so really from an early stage he knows exactly what's going to happen uh, and maybe he's just dotting the i's and crossing the t's um and obviously produces brilliant books that people love but i would just get very bored doing that because i would then for three years know exactly what was going to happen whereas my way I'm discovering the book as I go. And so I can surprise myself and, and entertain myself as I'm doing it. Right. I, and just I, so our I, listeners I, know, your writing process is essentially start at the first line, write all the way through from there and hardly edit, right? <laughs> yeah, which um, <laughs> when when people come to you uh, wanting tips as to how to write, that's uh, not a very satisfactory answer. People... <laughs> really looking for some sort of formula sort at the of beginning build it this way and, and put the bricks together <laughs> yeah. this way so well you know we were talking about story. people skipping to the end you won't even think about the end of your story until you've written it that's how anti uh <laughs> skip ahead yeah i mean <laughs> i this is one of the reasons i like to be uh well ahead in the writing process because uh, because i don't know how it's going to end wobble do not chew the cable <laughs> He's like, this I'm, is over. Time for food. I'm going to have to put him out of the. Out of, he's literally biting the table. <laughs> we haven't quite won over um, Womble yet, unfortunately. No, not yet. But sorry, right. maybe when Wobble listens back, he'll appreciate we it. We need more, more uh, cat-friendly content. I guess. Yeah, no, I, I was saying that I, I um, I need to be far ahead because um, I don't know how the thing's going to end. And there's always the possibility that I will just decide I've made a horrible mistake and there's nowhere to go and I have to rewrite the entire thing. It's never happened, but I feel much safer knowing that I'm two or three books ahead uh, because then if it did happen, it's not a problem. And when you remove the stress, that stops it happening. I, I feel like your experience is... It 
like with the writing process is much more unique than what I've <laughs> heard from other authors in the past. I'm just so amazed by it. Like you, you literally just, you know, you have a great idea, you sit down, you start at the beginning, you end at the end, like there's no plotting, no like, you know, kind of over complicating of it. it's like, hey, whatever I think is fun, whatever I want to write next, that's what I'm going to do. And I, I think it shows, you know, there's this idea that, you know, some like I, I read some fantasy books that I'm like, did you forget to be fun? Like we're in an uh, we're in an imaginary <laughs> world here, like you know, this magic and and you know, and we're we're getting so heavy in the drama, we forgot that there was like a world of possibilities here. So I, I can appreciate that. It, it just seems so um to me, it seems like a unique process. I don't I'm not sure, but uh oh, I'm I'm jealous in a way. <laughs> sometimes uh I get a kind of angry response to it as if like that's not true you're 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 you know you're hiding the true magic formula and and trying to to sort of wave us off with this nonsense um and then they will say you know how on earth did and then they'll sort of come up with some situation where it shouldn't be possible if you weren't planning for this to have happened and the way i like to explain it is that when you're reading a book you um you don't have no idea what's going to happen on the next page as you're reading a book you have you have ideas about what's where it's going uh, you have theories about what's going to happen next you might be right you might be wrong but you, do, you don't just say uh, turn the page and i've got zero idea because you know these people set off from this 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 city and they were aiming for this forest you have the idea that they're going to get there and that when they're going to get there they're going to do the thing they said they were going to do maybe they won't but so, and so even as a reader who didn't write the book as you are reading you have an idea where it's heading and you know obviously as i'm writing i have an idea the same sort of idea that the reader has about where it's heading it may be true it may not be true uh, and it gets fuzzier the further out you go and it's not written down but that's that's the sort of you know that's what i'm talking about that's, and so I'm going right. to you know, say one of the words we hear all the time in, in fantasy, and that's uh, world building. And I know in your case, you have so many settings that are incredibly unique and, and oftentimes uh, complex. You have like Book of the Ancestor, which is set in like this pretty much frozen over planet with one narrow corridor in which life can exist because of how the stars and planets are aligned. And, and so when it comes to, do you think of world building as world building, or is that part of your process of just like writing out the characters, writing what happens next? And you, you, that's another thing that it's just kind of is piecing together as you go along. Generally speaking, it's just piecing together as I go along. There's that's no... incredible. <laughs> because <laughs> so your settings one... are particularly impressive i find like so well, unique well, and so heavily in science too yeah yeah I, I qualified it by with generally because the the particular example you gave which was the the red sister well that one um i did think of um ahead of time just walking my dog around the park um, and then came in and wrote it down and the the reason it was there was from a discussion i'd had with peter v brett at one of the or after one of these um these three grim gatherings i went to where in his books um he has these demons that rise up out of the ground every night and and sort of um the uh every all the humans they have to ward themselves with with runes to, to keep the demons away and that, that that's the mechanism of the books and it goes on for the quintology um and he, he was saying to me well basically the the demons are just like a, a pressure that is applied to the characters and that um the point of the pressure is simply to sort of exercise the characters to, to sort of put them under duress and see what they're made of because the stories are about characters um and this is true that, that in most books the, the really interesting things are the characters that's why we're reading that's what we tend to remember and you, you want to put the characters under some pressure and strain and then we get to see what they're made of um, and that pressure and strain is sometimes not actually that important what it is it could be the demons rising out of the ground so what i um you know and he i think he or i described that as sort of just tightening the vice you know uh, on on your character just turning that screw and tightening uh, the clamps on them 
so so what i thought was um let's just make this into a physical thing make, make this analogy about writing into a physical thing in a book that i'm writing and have the the walls literally closing in on them on both sides you know so that the little rooms in indiana jones or the horror movies where the walls close in and squash you or star wars um <laughs> now they're walls of ice and they're squeezing everyone and that's a physical pressure that is making change happen um and so that's what i had and then i said well how am i gonna have walls of ice well have, if you have an ice planet and you burn a corridor around it then you've got walls of ice and they're going to keep on squeezing in that's a good so thing to know you think of that idea and then the next thing that comes to mind for you is it is important when killing a nun to ensure that you bring an army of sufficient size, which is the, the first line of Red Sister, which is uh, not just my favorite first line, but also the first line that if you on you know your social media site of choice were to ask what's your favorite first line fantasy, you are gonna get this answer almost definitely and certainly in the mix i mean that's a topic it's in the mix for sure among other first lines by you too uh <laughs> so yeah is that the your ability to write these incredible first lines like is that just when you get that first line in your head you're like oh that means it's time to start writing or do you sit down to start writing and suddenly just the brilliance pops into your head how, how do these lines come about no, I, I just sit down and write them. Um, and that's not to say that I could, it's not to say that I could do one a minute for the next hour. Um, <laughs> and obviously some are better than others. So, you know, um, that one is one that particularly resonated. Um, but I don't think at the time I wrote it, um, I was, you know, thinking that it was particularly special. I had a nice line, but um <sighs> I mean, I do get asked about first lines and just lines that people like in, in, in books I write and they talk about, you know, crafting them as if like, you know, I, I put down a line and then sort of stare at it a long time and poke the words around and put this word here and change. And it's none of that happens. That They're just lines I write as I'm typing the same speed and level of thought that goes into the next line that you don't notice. Um, and in a way it would be nice to if it was true and maybe it is true of some people so it may be nice to be one of those people or if it's not true of anyone it would be nice if it was true that somehow if you sort of sat there and made fists and squeezed them tighter and tighter and sort of really strained that you would get a better line to pop out because i get what i get and i don't change them so I, uh, and the reason I don't change them is um because I can't see how to make them better and I'm not saying that in a prideful way that they are perfect it's just I personally can't see how to make them better I don't feel any urge to tinker with things I've written I know some authors will have written this, the same chapter 10 times and like deleted it entirely and then written it again and deleted it entirely 10 times and not just one chapter but maybe 100 pages um and maybe the 10th iteration is stupendously better than the first um and whilst that's an awful lot of work it's also comforting that each time you're doing it if it's true it's getting better because you're sort of polishing the thing and you feel some sort of sense of achievement of the time spent but for me um i write something and I'm genuine, generally unable to change it. That I, if I do change it, it just looks worse to me. Um, and that's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because I can move fast, and people seem to quite like what I wrote in the first time. But it's a curse because I don't feel I can sort of do that fist squeezing and and sort of just try harder and make it better. It, it is what it is. That, that I just say that's how I would write that. Um, you know, maybe I typoed there, and maybe I used the same word three times and I should should change that but beyond that sort of level of thing um, I never feel the urge to delete the whole chapter or a whole page or a whole paragraph and write it again because I can't tell if the new one's better so I've just wasted time 
Um, and some people are the opposite, they just can't stop tinkering. I think I saw um, Lainey Taylor um, asking somewhat tongue in cheek, is there a way to lock a file because I can't stop playing with this thing? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I love her books. So obviously whatever she's doing is working, but um, that that's just, we all have different processes. Absolutely. And so we're, we're nearing on time here, but one of the things I want to make sure that we bring up for anyone that doesn't know is, is Spiffbo really quickly. So uh, was, for those of you that don't know, since 2015, I think, um, Mark's operated the annual self-published fantasy blog off, also known as Spiffbo, a literary contest um, intended to bring visibility to self-published uh, fantasy authors. And I find it so interesting that that's like to to think of the fantasy genre without it now is 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 hard to think of. It is such a like big part of the of the year. What I'm curious about, Mark, is how you like became kind of the creator operator of a self published fantasy vehicle, and what that kind of what the inspiration for that was, how it came to be. Yeah, um, I think again, it's it's one of these things that just happened at the right time. Um, I would call it luck, but I mean it's not particularly luck. It doesn't serve me in any way other than, than entertaining. Um, so um, yeah, it, it's a nice thing, and I'm glad that it has flourished. Um, I think this goes back to the beginning of of our discussion where I was talking about luck that I mm -hmm. felt, I believe. I have been very lucky to um, be in the position that, position that I, I'm in um, and that you can write a brilliant book and absolutely nothing will happen to it. So, uh, and my go-to example is always um, Senlin Ascends, which um, is a book I absolutely love and will defend its its merits um, to the death uh, as, a, as a brilliantly written um, book that's also very entertaining. And uh, Josiah Bancroft had, had written this and spent three years um, just beating himself to death, trying to to you know make people take notice of it, and got nowhere. You know, it, after three years, it had fifty ratings on on Goodreads, and, and he was at the end of his tether. Um, and that just shows me that you know you, you can be this this brilliant author and and just completely fail to fly just because of you know chance you know he'd obviously sent it off to well not obviously he had sent it off to lots of agents as well and they'd all said no and you know, so. um so i i just felt this sort of survivor guilt that, that i had been lucky and that there were obviously many great books out there self-published ones that just weren't getting that chance um and i like contests uh, and it just seems a fun thing to do. I know I knew a lot of bloggers at that point, um, and I, I sort of figured out that, it, that if uh, if they helped me, I would have to do almost nothing um, and take all the credit. Uh, so um, I, that you know, I, I uh, came up with this particular scheme and and uh, sort of uh, waved it in front of, of a, a group of bloggers, and they all said, "Yeah, we'd love to be in, involved," and that's what happened. Um, <laughs> And obviously it doesn't, you know, it's just another net. It's a second chance, but it's got big holes in it. So books can fall through that as well. So just because a book has entered the SPFBO and, and got, um, you know, uh, knocked out of it in, in the very first opportunity doesn't mean that it, it's not a worth your attention. It just, um, it is what it is. It's, it's hopefully a, a chance to bring um, some more great self-published books to the reading public's attention. And also the self-published books at that time had um, a bit of a bad reputation in that. And I think part of it was that you, people felt unsafe that if they were to, because, you know, all they would do is go on Amazon and they'd see this enormous wall of, of books, all of which had like two reviews or which said, this is the best book ever and possibly written by the author's mum. And so <laughs> they had no idea of which ones to choose. And then they would choose one at random and it might not be very good. And, and then they were burned and they were scared of going back. So, and, and uh, bloggers typically were, were not reviewing these things. So, because bloggers like to review things that have a lot of interest in them because then that pulls in views for them. Um, 
so it was a sort of vicious circle that they couldn't get noticed uh, and they couldn't and they couldn't attract interest because people felt unsafe reading them you know maybe this is going to be a waste of my time and money um and then so that that vicious circle so it, it was a way that if you had this contest you would then at the end of it have 10 books each year where a bunch of bloggers had said these are the best of a bunch of 300 and hopefully they not only said these are the best but they will say these are great and these compete well with the books you might buy in the bookshop and then people would feel more safe coming to those and reading those and if they enjoyed them feel more safe branching out and trying other other self-published books well i know that it's dylan really and i interest oh go ahead dylan you go yeah ahead. yeah the I joys mean, of talking on zoom you totally <laughs> changed the yeah yeah you totally changed the landscape of self-published fantasy books i feel like and i had the honor to be one of the uh, judges in, in spiffbo seven for bef uh, beth tabler's before we go blog and it was, it was really interesting uh, to get to be a part of it so it's such a, a cool staple of the genre now and and also what i'm hearing is apparently when you make mark lawrence feel guilty good things happen because <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> spiffbo came out of you feeling guilty to the survivor's guilt and then uh, also your entire writing career came out of you feeling guilty so well, yes, i don't want to make you feel guilty about anything but also i want to see what kind of amazing things might happen so <laughs> i don't know i'm, I'm kind of torn we have correlation here that's all i'm saying <laughs> yeah there's, there's 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 going on. yeah yeah. <laughs> and we've read a lot of great books off of off of spiff bow and it, it's been a great source of of what kind of mining for content for us it's so many talented authors and, and and voices and stories that get kind of a second chance to to shine through those competitions so i would always enjoy seeing what pops up from there and many of them do end up getting like you know some of them have gotten traditional publishing deals afterwards too which is always great to see yes quite a few of them and not just the the champions but you know and not even just the um the finalists you know because um Stanley in the sense wasn't the finalist um and i think uh is it James Isington, The Shadow of What Was Lost? That was a, another oh. semi-finalist that... Um, I didn't even realize that. Wow. Yeah. That's but, awesome. you, you know, you said, uh, oh, you changed the, the landscape a bit. I, I feel it's one of those things where you're not sure if something's the wind or the windsock that um, mm. these changes would have come along anyway. Um, I just happened to be sort of the windsock that that uh, benefited from from the wind. <laughs> Uh, sure. you know yeah, I, I, self publishing was always self publishing was always going to be a huge thing um and and you've got names like anthony ryan and and the, the guy who wrote the marsh and you know coming up without you know <laughs> any help whatsoever um so it, it's a piece of fun and i if it makes uh uh people feel good then that's great yeah so modest isn't he folks <laughs> we love that about <laughs> about mark <laughs> well i think the danger is that if, you, if you're not um modest then you just look um completely arrogant because i mean this is this is a contest and, and you know you were saying dylan you were a judge for the, um before we go blog all of the work is done by by the blogs and the people you know making up those blogs and I just sit back and collate a table, uh, you know, and, and knock people off or, or add up scores. So, you know, that's uh, a huge um, that math discrepancy right. between the amount of effort put in. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I'm very wary of, of taking too much credit for it because, uh, like I say, there, there's this, this immense effort that's put in by all these bloggers. And I just sit there and I would say look pretty, but that's not even true. <laughs> well, th there's something to be said about being like, the self-published fantasy kind of stamp of approval you know i i think the self-published world in fantasy is so rich and like the community is really strong and, and supportive and like the fact that everybody's on board with spiffbo is a pretty amazing thing that just kind of came together you know and, and i say just kind of came together you and all these blogs did tons of work obviously but it's one of those things that's like you know I feel like one rose up and became like the 
a stamp of approval almost. And um, I, I think that certainly counts for something. Yeah, so I, and I, I think, think there are a, a few other that. contests for, for self-published books that are now um, fantasy books that are now in the offing uh, or, or actually underway. I couldn't actually give you their names, but uh, I'm, I'm feeling they're out there, which is a good thing. And um, Hugh Howie for the title. <laughs> yeah, Hugh Howie is running the, one um, now too. the science fiction one that, that's, that's yeah. a sort of sister to um, Spiff Bow. There's no formal connection, but uh, um, he sort of um, had a chat with me about it and uh, I encouraged him to do it. It's incredible. Well, yeah. um, Mark, I mean, this has been such a great experience for us. We know it's super late over there uh, across right? the pond, so we won't take up any more of your time than we already have. Just to say that, you know, like Dylan and I said at the top of the episode, we used to talk about your books and there is a moment in King of Thorns towards the end that, you know, we still talk about to this day is surprising oh, us, yeah. which will keep spoiler free. <laughs> but uh, there's a moment where something happens that um, that we were just like, ending. yeah, we were just, you know, <laughs> like, can you do this in a fantasy book? And uh, like uh, we were talking the when yes. the answer was yes. And we were talking before we ever thought to turn microphones on but i think dylan you can correct me if i'm wrong but i i think um you know prince of thorns and the whole broken empire trilogy like everyone had watched you know game of thrones and read the books and we're talking about it everyone loved lord of the rings and we're talking about it but when you've got a friend that you can like talk about prince of thorns with when it comes out in 2011 that's when you know you found like a a friend in, in in fantasy, right? And I, I think that's when Dylan and I realized that we had a a very unique mutual interest compared to uh, um, our other friends, and it kind of got us into this world of talking specifically about fantasy, right, Dylan? Yeah, it's your work has been kind of a through line for us regarding like our friendship around fantasy books, and then like because Prince of Thorns was. Uh, one of one of our main books that got us from like okay we like game of thrones to like oh wow we we like fantasy books and uh, this one's so awesome and we then like got to have that moment where uh, you listen to our episode like i was saying before and that was so legitimizing like i was saying so it's like uh, these moments have always been benchmarks for us around <laughs> fantasy and like to have it, it come full circle in this way and be interviewing you now uh yeah well it's, it's enough really of false cool modesty I, i'm gonna take full credit for this i am entirely <laughs> responsible for friends talking fantasy they, they should really just slap my name across it Oh, absolutely. There absolutely. we go. No need to be <laughs> modest on this one. And Not at all. You definitely played a huge part. Because so, Dylan, can you imagine I, if one of us liked Prince of Thorns and the other one hated it, and then we just never talked about fantasy books again? It could have happened. <laughs> right. Writing a great book was uh, that appealed to both <laughs> of us, uh, played definitely a, a seminal role. So we're glad you're taking full credit now, Mark. We we talked you out all this modesty nonsense, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll call that a win if we're, we're coming out of the interview having accomplished that. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And guys, do not forget about the book That Wouldn't Burn. It is available now well, for pre-order and then it releases May 9th, which we're super excited about. And hopefully we can uh, do a, a more in-depth discussion on that in, in the springtime or I guess, you know, whatever season May's in so that we can uh, this spring so that we can uh, read it and uh, have an in-depth full spoiler discussion on that because I'm so curious to see you know, wh what direction you're going in uh, in your in your writing career so uh, congratulations on the book and we're looking forward to reading it stuff awesome thanks everybody <laughs> and uh, as always I'll do my famous outro here and uh, uh, go forth and conquer friends.